One summer afternoon, 35 young cadets, with all the confidence of veteran pilots, took off from a training base for a cross-country flight. Clear skies with unlimited visibility prevailed at their base. However, the weather forecast called for scattered thunderstorms over the route to be flown. After 30 minutes of clear sailing, a thunderstorm was observed directly on course. 25 of the cadets estimated the situation correctly and decided to circumnavigate the storm, which was only 10 to 15 miles across. Ten cadets decided to save time. They elected to stay on the course and fly through the storm in order to arrive at their destination ahead of the rest. Six of these men crashed and were killed. No time was saved. The time it had taken to train those six pilots, the time it had taken to build the six trainers, all this was lost forever to the service of the country. Such storms look very much like this. And if not properly handled, may be as dangerous as a burst of machine gun bullets from the nose of an enemy plane. In order to safely fly through thunderstorm areas, a knowledge of how they are formed is essential. There are two general types of thunderstorms. Frontal thunderstorms and air mass thunderstorms. Air mass thunderstorms result when the sun heats a land surface. This heating action causes air to rise and cool. These storms occur over land areas during the afternoon and early evening hours. They dissipate during the night due to the cooling of the surface. Cold air moving out over a warm body of water will produce the same type of storm. Storms formed in this manner are not so violent and do not extend to as great height as those formed by the sun's action over land. They're just as common at night as during the day, as the temperature of the water remains relatively constant both day and night. Air mass thunderstorms also occur when air is lifted up the mountain slope. Thunderstorms resulting from this cause form on the windward side of the ridge. They are common along coastal areas when onshore winds prevail during many seasons of the year. They may be isolated over a given mountain peak or quite general along a mountain range. These storms extend to great heights and are usually violent. Frontal thunderstorms occur when a wedge of cold air moves into a region of warmer air. The cold air acts as an inclined plane, just as the windward side of hills or mountains. Here again, the warm air is forced up and cooled. Thunderstorms formed by this method are generally concentrated along a line which may extend for many hundreds of miles. Although the storm line appears to be solid, in reality, it is a series of individual thunderstorms closely knitted together with other clouds with no visible space between. Basic characteristics of all thunderstorms are the same. The up and down drafts of air cause great turbulence. They are more violent in front than in the rear of the storm. Eddies along the edges of these currents of air 
caused the external cauliflower appearance of the cloud. The anvil top is produced by the spreading out of the vertical current when they reach their maximum height. The updraft of air ahead of the storm and the downdraft in the storm cause a roll cloud to form at the base of the leading edge. Directly under this area, variable and shifting surface winds prevail. The thunderstorm is a real weather factory. Rain, hail, and lightning are formed in its cold, turbulent region. The raindrops, which are caught in the updraft and carried into the freezing zone, become ice. They continue to grow in size in the freezing area until too heavy to be suspended, then fall as hail. Hailstones vary greatly in size. The average size is that of a pea. However, in very rare cases, they may be as large as baseballs. Turbulence causes the rain droplets to be broken into many parts. This disintegrating action results in the building up of static electric charges in the cloud. When these charges are great enough, lightning occurs. These electrical discharges may be observed as horizontal lightning or as vertical lightning. The darkest area under the storm is the region of heaviest rain and marks the storm center. The rain causes low clouds to form and reduces ceilings and visibility. Hail is sometimes encountered in the heavy rain. The more frequent the vertical lightning in this area, the more violent the storm. Thunderstorms vary greatly in size and intensity. The smaller ones, which in reality are merely overgrown showers, are from 12 to 15,000 feet high and present no serious hazard to fly. The largest storms vary from 30,000 up to 60,000 feet. These are the dangerous types. They vary in diameter from 5 to 25 miles. The most violent activity occurs in the lower two-thirds of the storm cloud. For example, if it is 30,000 feet from the base to the top of the cloud, the greatest turbulence is in the lower 20,000 feet. The intensity of the storm is dependent upon the distance from the base of the cloud to the freezing level. The greater this distance, the more violent the storm. In the higher latitude, the freezing level is closer to the Earth's surface, resulting in less violent individual thunderstorm activity with lower tops. In the lower latitude, and as the equator is approached, the freezing level becomes farther and farther from the Earth's surface, resulting in higher tops and more violent individual thunderstorm activity. At any given latitude, thunderstorms vary in size with the seasons. In the summer months, they reach their maximum height. In the fall and spring, their tops are lower due to the freezing line being closer to the Earth's surface, and the anvil top is not so readily apparent. The freezing level is closer to the Earth during the cold seasons of the year. Therefore, Thunderstorms are less frequent. In summary, 
thunderstorms tower to great heights and have a spreading anvil top. The region of greatest violence is the lower two-thirds of the cloud. It has an external cauliflower appearance with a roll cloud at the leading edge at the base. A dark area of rain appears underneath the core of the storm. These identifying features are not always so easy to see. They may be masked by other clouds. Low clouds forming underneath may hide the roll cloud and the dark rain area and the base of the real storm. Shelves of clouds sometimes extend for many miles out in front. These clouds may hide the top of the storm from a low-flying plane. These same clouds may hide the base of the storm from a high-flying plane. Although these shelves of clouds conceal the real storm centers, they do indicate to the pilot that he is at the front of the disturbance. The anvil top will lean in the direction the storm is moving. Air mass thunderstorms may be isolated and scattered over a wide area. They also may be grouped in a compact bunch, covering many hundreds of square miles. Air mass thunderstorms may be located over an individual mountain peak or extend in a solid line along a mountain range. Frontal thunderstorms generally exist as a solid wall extending for many hundreds of miles. Thunderstorms are more varied in appearance, size, and shape than are human beings. Here are some actual conditions as they appear in nature. This cloud has not built up to the thunderstorm state. However, it shows evidence of considerable turbulence, as indicated by the boiling effect. An isolated thunderstorm in the last stages of development. Within half an hour, rain began to fall, and lightning discharges were observed. An example of an isolated, well-defined thunderstorm that has formed over an island. The dark area underneath is heavy rain. This storm has more violence and vertical growth than if it had formed over the open sea. As it has formed over the island, it will have a tendency to dissipate after sunset. A towering thunderstorm over the open sea, the light behind clearly defines the edges of the clouds. An example of a thunderstorm partly masked by surrounding clouds. The center of the storm is to the right of the scene where the heavy rain is occurring. Thunderstorms are many times masked by surrounding clouds. This storm is approaching, as indicated by the shelf of clouds extending out in front. This is a line of storms with the sun shining through them from behind. Therefore, the storm centers show up darker than masking clouds. Storms with no light behind them are not so clearly defined, and it is more difficult to recognize and avoid the turbulent areas. This cumulus cloud is building into a thunderstorm. Rain is beginning to fall from the base, and the top is forming into the anvil shape. A line of clouds with widely scattered thunderstorm activity. 
At this stage, the storm would not present a serious hazard to a properly conducted flight. This is a condition where the outer roll cloud on the leading edge of a line of storms is very near the Earth's surface and too low to fly under. Violent turbulence would be experienced in this region and it would be inadvisable to attempt flying through this area. The boiling effect in these clouds indicates great turbulence. The center of the storm is indicated by the rain area on the right of the scene. This is how a storm looks from a low level, with the rain and ragged clouds at the base clearly visible. A cloud formation called mammatus. It is generally a part of the underside of the deck of clouds projecting out in front of the storm. When the mammatus cloud precedes thunderstorm activity, the storm is usually severe. This is a line of thunderstorms with well-defined anvil tops, taken from an altitude of 18,000 feet. The storms are some 130 miles away, and the anvil tops reach an altitude of 35,000 feet. This shows how storm tops may be clearly defined while the bases are hidden from a high-flying plane by surrounding clouds. This is a fully developed thunderstorm with the veil top spread into the anvil shape. The position of the top indicates the movement from right to left. Here, the veil top is spread to a greater degree and does not have the characteristic anvil shape, but indicates a thunderstorm at its maximum intensity. A storm line over water. The veil tops identify the well-defined thunderstorm activity. The main storms, however, are masked by surrounding clouds. Thunderstorms at night have the same general characteristics as those in the daytime, but present a greater hazard due to reduced visibility. The storm centers are many times revealed by lightning flashes. A preponderance of vertical strokes is an indication that the storm is being approached from the front. These lightning flashes will also reveal the height of the storm base above the surface. The more frequent the vertical flashes, the more violent the storm. Horizontal lightning flashes generally indicates less violent activity. The presence of this type of lightning is usually an indication that the back of the storm is being approached. Lightning flashes will many times reveal the type of surface beneath the storm. This is especially useful where a rugged country is concerned. High-level lightning flashes within the cloud frequently reveal the location of the top of the thunderstorm. As a pilot approaches the thunderstorm area, the flight procedures to use will depend upon the type of storm, the locality over which it lies, the type of equipment, the altitude, and the mission to be performed. The storm should be analyzed before the surrounding clouds are encountered as they might obscure the important characteristics. Study the situation thoroughly before making a decision. Whether encountering a single storm, 
a group of storms or a line of storms, the flight procedures are similar. The pilot may circumnavigate the storm centers through a thin spot or clear area or fly at a low level underneath the base of the thunderstorm or fly at a high level over a saddleback between storm tops. Always fly around isolated air mass thunderstorms. Do not try to save time by flying a straight course through the thunderstorm when they can be avoided by circumnavigation. The added mileage and the time lost are of little consequence. It is a good practice to fly around thunderstorms in mountainous regions. When thunderstorms prevail along coastal mountain ranges, a flight conducted a few miles to seaward will avoid this activity. Thunderstorms over islands may be many thousands of feet higher than those associated with the open sea and should be circumnavigated. A wall of thunderstorms caused by a front presents many problems when applying the rule of circumnavigation. The storm line is generally too long to fly around. It should be kept in mind, however, that the storm front is a series of individual thunderstorms closely knitted together by intervening clouds. It is often possible, therefore, to fly between these storm centers through holes or thin spots. Sometimes the hole is obvious with blue sky on the other side and presents no problem to circumnavigation. In some cases, it is impossible to see through the hole, but there is definite evidence of thinness. In this case, determine the direction in which the line of storms is moving and head in at a right angle. This will reduce flying time in the storm to a minimum. After you have once set your course and started through, don't turn around on account of turbulence, rain, or hail. This will result in flying through the same conditions twice. There is also the added hazard of becoming lost. It does not take long to fly through if a straight course is maintained. A pilot approaching a line of thunderstorms at a low altitude can fly underneath their base if circumstances permit. This procedure is recommended when flying over flat terrain or the open sea. In determining a course underneath, the storm centers can be identified by the dark rain areas. Here, visibility is reduced and lightning flashes are frequent. Therefore, it is preferable to conduct the flight through the clear areas between storm centers. Lightning is of no serious concern when flying an all-metal closed cockpit airplane, as the craft acts as a perfect conductor. However, bright flashes may cause the pilot to be temporarily blinded. If lightning strikes an open cockpit airplane, it might injure the pilot and cause structural damage to the craft. The turbulence under thunderstorms 
may place heavy stress on aircraft, and the inexperienced instrument pilot may have difficulty controlling his plane. The closer you fly to the surface of the Earth, the less turbulent it will be. A good rule to follow is to fly one-third of the distance from the surface to the base of the cloud. For example, if the cloud is determined to be 3,000 feet above the surface, fly at 1,000 feet. On approaching the front of the storm, an updraft will be encountered. Under the low cloud region, strong up and down drafts will be experienced. At the core of the storm, a downdraft is usually encountered. Then an updraft may lift the plane toward the base of the storm. Finally, there is a downdraft before breaking into the clear. In a flight under the storm, the higher the flight level, the rougher the trip. Care must be taken to prevent being lifted into the cloud forming the storm base. When flying under the storm from the rear, the pilot will experience a downdraft first. This leads to the following rule. When entering a storm from the rear, enter at a higher level than you would if entering from the front. When visibility is bad underneath and contact flight cannot be maintained, it is inadvisable to fly under the storm. In the case of thunderstorm conditions along mountain ranges, never attempt to fly underneath unless a good ceiling exists and the visibility is such that peaks and ridges are clearly defined. Never land at an airport when the wind shifts in advance of a thunderstorm is approaching the field. Turbulent and shifting surface winds make this a hazardous procedure. Since thunderstorms move at a speed of from 10 to 30 knots, it is often possible to wait until the storm center has passed before landing. high-level flight is anticipated, the pilot should seek a high level before approaching the storm, getting on top of the protruding shelf of clouds around the storm. This will give him an opportunity to inspect the storm line and select his course. When thunderstorms are associated with rough terrain, high-level flight is preferable. This procedure is the safest in cases where the pilot is not familiar with mountain ranges and mountain peaks. When flying at a high level, it is inadvisable to fly underneath overhanging clouds associated with the anvil top, as hail is often encountered in these regions. Try to pick a spot that has no overhanging clouds. Lines of thunderstorms over land generally extend to greater heights than those over the open sea. 15,000 feet will usually top the saddlebacks of a storm line over the sea. In some cases, it is impossible to establish a path which will conform to the three basic flight procedures.
When you are faced with this problem, there are two courses open. Fly between storm areas as high as possible to miss the greatest turbulence. Or fly between storm areas as low as possible, avoiding the roll clouds and staying safely above the highest terrain. Here's a report of a pilot who encountered a storm and could not establish any one of the three basic flight procedures and was forced to fly through. Took off from home field on an important mission to a base in the canal zone. Forecast of thunderstorm conditions ahead. Early in the evening, the predicted conditions were encountered. A wall of storms appeared, extending for hundreds of miles to the east and west. Mountains paralleled the coast from north to south and extended up into the clouds at 14,000 feet. So, laid a course out to sea. The storm extended down close to the water and appeared violent preventing flight under. It could not be thrown around, so climbed, trying to top it. At 16,000 feet, the ship became sluggish due to heavy load. And as the cloud still towered up beyond this point, it was apparent that the plane would not be able to get over. There was now no other course but to go through shows a spot which appeared to be between two storm centers. Checked instruments. Reduced flying speed and headed in at a right angle. Turned on cockpit lights to avoid temporary blindness from anticipated lightning flashes. First updraft was not strong then encountered very heavy turbulence. Rain fell in torrents. Visibility dropped to zero. Was tempted to turn back in search of a better point of entry, but did not want to risk becoming lost and add to flying time in the storm. Frequent lightning flashes. Some boats probably struck the craft, but the charges were conducted off as the ship was an all-metal, closed cockpit shop. Suddenly, the plane was rocked by a violent downdraft, indicating midway point of the storm. Ran into hail. Fortunately, it was soft and splattered against the ship without damage. After emerging from the strongest turbulence, the display of St. Elmo's fire was encountered. Static electricity was building up on the plane. Flashes of light jumped across the surfaces of the windshield. Streamers of electricity played up and down the wings. And at the same time, fiery blue-green circles formed on the periphery of the propellers cut flying speed further to avoid an electric discharge which might damage the radio. Shortly afterwards, broke out into the clear, the rest of flight was uneventful. In summary, the pilot headed seaward when he encountered a storm condition which had built up along the coastal mountains. For at sea, he would find the intensity of the storm less severe. He did not attempt to fly under the condition since it lay almost on the surface and appeared very violent at that point. He was unable to go around the storm wall since the front extended for several hundred miles. The storm was too high to fly over, so he chose a thin area when forced to fly through to avoid the cores of any of the storms. He headed in at a right angle. This was for the purpose of flying a straight course through the storm and reducing his flying time within it to a minimum. He 
He turned his cockpit lights on and kept his eyes on the instrument panel to avoid temporary blindness when lightning flashed close to the plane. Although tempted to turn back upon encountering the heaviest turbulence, the pilot chose to continue on his original course, knowing that he might otherwise become lost and his flying time in the storm be greatly increased. When he found static electricity building up on the plane, he slowed his speed to reduce the possibility of a discharge which would produce a blinding flash and possibly destroy radio communication. Experience has taught that the safest course is to stay away from thunderstorms. However, due to the urgency of many present day missions, it is often necessary to break this rule. The modern airplane is the best for its purpose that human ingenuity can devise. When flying through thunderstorm conditions, the pilot must have confidence in his knowledge of the structure of thunderstorms and confidence in his equipment. Remember, it is the pilot that loses his head and not the plane. 